So we're making this hard decision. I think it's the right decision to protect the future of the fishery. And I also just want to encourage um, everybody, staff, the department, our stakeholders to uh, to think hard about how we can address the, the, the bigger drivers of this problem of these declines that have to do with water management and diversions that have to do with the ecological needs. I'll move that the commission adopt the negative declaration prepared pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, approves the proposed project, and adopts proposed changes to subsection 7.40B4, 43, 66, and 80 related to Central Valley sport fishing regulations for the 2023 season as discussed today. I will second that motion. Motion made by Vice President Zavaleta, seconded by Commissioner Hosser Carmerson. Roll call, please. Vice President Zavaleta. Aye. Commissioner Hosser Carmerson. Aye. President Squar. Aye. Commissioner Murray. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. My name is John Atkinson. I own and operate New Ray Ann Sport Fishing in Sausalito. I started working here in 1980, took the boat over in 1990 to present. This closure has been very impactful to our harbor in Sausalito. All the boats in this port have made their businesses based off salmon fishing. So in a typical year, the boats would be running five months straight without a day off. This year, we're lucky to see one boat out a day, and that's, that's pushing it. Salmon are the driver in the Bay Area sport fishing fleet. Without a salmon season, nobody's making money, no matter what you're fishing for. The managers think, oh, they can go rockfish, they can go halibut. It doesn't work that way. Salmon drive the sport fishing industry in California. All over the world, the development of rivers has always been part of man's progress. His conquest of rivers and his improvement of them for his own use demonstrated by the rivers of our own west. Let's consider the four main rivers of the Pacific Slope to see for ourselves how important they are and how they have been made useful to the people of the western United States. The Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers are equally important to the great Central Valley of California. Salmon are caught in the river and also in the ocean along the Pacific coast. About 70 million pounds of salmon are caught each year in the Pacific coast states. Sa salmon are this, because they live this unique life cycle from being born in the rivers, they migrate out to the ocean during their first year. They spend one to three years in the ocean and come back and spawn. If any one of those points in that chain is broken, we see a failure. And it's really, there isn't, everything is important. And it's super unsatisfactory from a management perspective. But it's the reality of the life cycle of the salmon. And that each of those, that the spawning habitat is important. The out-migration flow conditions are important. The rearing conditions during that out-migration, the estuary, the ocean, and then coming back as adults. Whether they're spring run that are over summering, in the rivers or their fall run that are coming right back up and spawning, each of those things is a weak point and it can be a weak point in that if conditions aren't good. Salmon fishing to us is probably the most important thing we'd have here in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, it's the number one draw from all around the West Coast. People come here to experience this wonderful fishery that we once had. Nowhere else in the West Coast is fishing this prominent inland. And to see it shut down the way it is again for the second time is mind blowing. Well, I think the perception when you talk about fish, everybody just thinks about it in fish, it, it is a bigger issue. If something is wrong with fisheries in general, there's more problems, water quality, management, resources, farmers, ag, the dams, the levee systems, it, it's endless. Where we find ourselves in 2023 today is a result of some policy decisions that have been made over the last couple decades. 
And when we last had a conversation and chatted about this, the continuation and the downward deterioration of salmon populations is only accelerating, right? And I think you see that with the 2023 closure, the complete commercial and recreational closure in the entire Sacramento system and out in the ocean. So one thing that's very clear to me is that whatever actions we're taking and whatever policies we're implementing, they're not having the desired effect because we continue to go backwards and salmon populations continue to struggle so much so to the point that we've now had to have the second closure in the last two decades. Well, if the government wants to help the salmon, they could follow the, the water temperature laws that we already have in place. Uh, the water flows, uh, raise more fish. I do, I mean, look at this year, even though we didn't harvest out in the oceans and everything, we have lots of water this year. We should be seeing these, these riffle areas and everything, salmon should just be all over and we're seeing a lot of fish this year but i think it's because we haven't you know harvested them. a closure in 2023 has been absolutely devastating for my business and multiple multiple colleagues of ours a lot of us have had to leave the state and fish elsewhere to make a living big so big red is a multi-generational business uh, my parents bought the business about 15 years ago uh, they both passed on, I've taken it over. I have a two and a half year old son that's already out playing in the shop, playing with chicken liver and everything else. Um, and the way I'm looking at it right now is if things keep going the way they're going with, with management, uh, he's not gonna have a business to take over. I would say the number one stressor is the hot water in the rivers, especially in the fall and in the spring, affecting the adults and the young. Four or six weeks ago, the river was 60 degrees just above their spawning preference until to about today it's been 65 to 68 degrees because they're trying to save the water and pull some of the cold water for the fall run later in November and December but they can't spawn until it's 55 and this is late September. These salmon all want to spawn and they probably would have spawned by now if they could have uh, the ones that are in here but they can't because it's 65 degrees so they're going to wait and keep the water warm until November 1st, a month from now. And then they'll bring the water temperature down, they'll open the gates here at the ladder and bring the salmon in. But they'll be sitting out here for four to eight weeks. And that's when they get that thiamine deficiency. That's when they just take on disease. Uh, it's just not healthy for them. A lot of the females will start to reabsorb their eggs. They'll even spawn right out here. I mean, you want fish, you add water. That's, I mean, that's common sense. And uh, the way the Bureau of Reclamation has allocated water for the last 30 years is ridiculous. Between water temperature, low water, ocean conditions, and habitat, is we have done everything we could to these fish. And in some ways, it's a miracle that they're still here. I've sat through fishing game fish and wildlife meetings, I've sat through commission meetings and PFMC meetings, and it's pretty tough, you know, listening to the disregard for salmon, I guess it is, because there's not, no one that really cares as much as the guides and the public, the recreational fishermen, and it's disappearing and it's, it's going to end unless they change the ways, because the stuff that's happened in the meetings that the general public doesn't know, it's just criminal. Salmon fishing, recreational salmon fishing in Northern California has been a big part of the economy. Not just for guides, not just for tackle shops. You've got gas stations, restaurants, lodging. You've got an influx of people coming from out of the area spending money, focusing on tourism, fun things. And that just, dry, just dried up. It didn't happen overnight. It's been drying up for years. We've been feeling the pinch from the salmon disaster far before this year. Well, when you have a, a salmon return and steelhead, you know, salmon in particular, you know, we're talking about something that uh, happens right here. It's a way of our life uh, here in Northern California for six, seven months out of the year. Uh, this is one of the few rivers in, in the world, if not the only one, that has four recognizable runs of Chinook salmon. Uh, we fish for it, or I fish for it, along with other uh, outfitters, and, 
and sportsmen and women. We fish for salmon, six, you know, July through uh, d uh, December. We used to fish in the January. Um, in the old days before I even had a shot at it, there was salmon fishing here year round, 12 months a year. But now we only uh, get a shot at it six months out of the year. And, you know, I can think of being a young man in my 20s of how plentiful the salmon was and, and how good the fishing was and just to see it deteriorate. It's, I, I've never really seen it get any better. I've just noticed things going away. Um, one of the biggest things I can, can recognize and remember is, is when I first uh, remember going over the Market Street Bridge in downtown Reading. You know, you couldn't cross that bridge in October or late September without seeing 20, 30 salmon breaching the water trying to jump over the ACID structure. And uh, that is gone. We don't see any fish there anymore. Um, there's very few fish uh, left to fish for. There's absolutely no fishing up in Reading anymore for salmon. So salmon fishing is, is uh, a big part of our life, but it just seems to be just dwindling away little by little. And, and now it's to the point of now I'm looking at my fourth closure of my life. You know, this is the fourth time it's closed. And if it were to continue to next year, it'd be uh, five times out of the last 16 years. Well, if the water gets too hot, they got to mitigate for that. They've got to, you know, they got to raise more fish. They got to readjust their, their model and, and, get, and, and, and just raise more fish. If the water's too hot, we got to put more fish in. Um, if they have a bad die off, we got to put, we got to raise more fish. When I got in the industry about 40 years ago, it was, uh, it was good. There was a lot of boats on the dock and it was, uh, it was a good business. There were actually dedicated salmon boats. We'd just do nothing but salmon fishing. Year round, huh? Uh, well, it wasn't a year round, but I mean, it was, it was a year round fishery. We had rock cod fishing. Uh, that was a year round fishery. And uh, they've done closures to it, and, but the salmon fishery was always a bright spot. You know, people would come out and then people would come out salmon fishing and then they'd want to get on a rock cod boat to try something different, you know. And, and so we would have designated boats. Some boats would fish salmon, some boats would fish bass and halibut, some boats would fish uh, rockfish, but the majority of the boats fish salmon. And we've slowly have morphed away from that and everybody's been on survival mode fishing for anything they can. So is salmon like the primary driver though of this fleet? Salmon drives the entire industry. I mean salmon drives everything from striper halibut trips to rock cod trips to all trips. Everything everything evolves around salmon. Salmon's like the nucleus that holds all the fisheries together. The Department of Fish and Game, or in Fish and Wildlife, should be regulating the Water Resource Board, not the fishermen. They've been regulating the fishermen for the last 40 years, and they haven't achieved anything. They have learned that the fishermen are not the problem. The water is the problem. And they need to understand that. They need to regulate that, not the fishermen. That is my frustration and anger of this whole industry is they are regulating the wrong people. Well, of course, the basis for improving the run are these very fine brood males that we use. Just as a farmer must have a high quality uh, sire for his herd, so we use the very choicest males to fertilize the eggs. Now, this fellow wrestling around here is a, is a really choice male Chinook salmon. So with so many fish in Battle Creek, you want to be able to represent the whole run. And so you have to move fish through the system. And the only way to do that is we would spawn and get our number for that particular spawn day. And then the rest of the day, we ran two shifts. We would just cull fish out and kill them and load them on trucks. And they went up to Bellingham, Washington and uh, we're processed for the California Food Bank, is what we were told. I am James Stone with NorCal Guides and Sportsman's Association. We're up here at American Canadian Fisheries in Bellingham, Washington. We're asking questions about all the hatchery fish that they bring in. They said this year in 2019, they brought in over a million pounds of fish from California, Oregon, and Washington, but they're not wasted. The fish are right here for sale. 
$8.99 a pound for a pale orange meat, not high quality, but the middle of the road. You can get it all right here, or you can actually buy the lower quality fish right here. Three dollars a pound for our fish right here. No adipose fin. That's a clipped hatchery fish right here from the Feather River. We only do adipose fin clipping of 25% of our fall run at, at Coleman. Is that correct? Correct. And so it's safe to say that when we were doing all of this calling back in the 90s and 2000s and killing all these unspawned fish, did we have any ways to identify whether that fish came from the hatchery or that fish came from the natural spawn or we just killed everything that came in or called anything that came into that creek that we weren't going to use? We called everything that came in and the ones that had the adipose clip, we'd call it out, the biologists would take them out and take take the heads. So it's safe to say that it's very likely that natural spawning fish that did have an adipose fin were called in the river and in the creek during those time periods. They could be at any time. That's a great point. I think that that's one of the biggest misconceptions of the entire program is that by only marking 25% of those fish, it leaves the illusion that all of the rest of the fish that have a that have an adipose fin are wild or natural spawning and uh, theoretically that's not true correct and with you know the hatchery being on battle creek since the 1890s just about every salmon in that creek has been hatchery was a hatchery born fish at one point or their parents or grandparents or I can't tell the difference between a hatchery fish and a natural fish. They both fight the same. Um, I mean, I've caught them all. I would agree with you. I think that I've caught uh, thousands of salmon in my life, and I know that uh, you know they all eat the same, they all fight the same, and it's very amazing to me that there's this stigma about hatchery fish being inferior. And in my mind, it seems that a hatchery fish that goes down the challenge of making it 274 miles from Battle Creek and lives in the ocean for three to five years and then returns facing all of the challenges that it faces would be just as strong or as fit as a natural spawning fish in my opinion. And yeah, I, my opinion too, I mean, what is the difference? Are the other ones gonna be faster, quicker, bigger? They're all eating the same thing. They're all doing the same, running against the same currents. They're all from the same genetics. They all carry the characteristics of the Jurassic salmon here. And you can reverse engineer or reverse breed many of these factors. I talked earlier about trying to get more four-year-olds, bigger salmon, and you can do that in the hatchery and, and in the river. Uh, I think you can segregate the adults coming back in the river and allow only the best of what you want into the upper 10 miles of river and let them spawn in the upper 10 miles of river with good conditions. The conditions are often hor horrific and they don't have to be. Better water management is needed. I've never once heard a customer complain of size of a hatchery fish, taste of a hatchery fish, the fight of a hatchery fish, the beauty of a hatchery fish. All I know is once they catch a, a Chinook salmon, they are a customer for life. We're here today on the Sacramento River on River Mile Marker 274 at the mouth of Battle Creek at the famous Barge Hole, where most of the iconic king salmon fishing is done here on the Sacramento River. This area is so important because our hatchery fish from Coleman National Fish Hatchery have to escape this river and then get into the main stem and make it 274 miles down to Rio Vista and then an additional 40 to 50 miles out the Golden Gate. We have seen really low returns on this river over the past few years. 2021 and 2022 have been full collapses. 
And this year in 2023, the estimates were is that we were gonna have very low number returns because two generations ago, six years ago, we trucked all of our fish from the Coleman National Fish Hatchery, brood year 2014, trucked in 2015. Three years later in 2017, those returns were some of the lowest on record. And now here we are six years later, two three-year generational cycles later, and now we're seeing that same collapse happening. The cohort has not reconstructed itself, and therefore that's why we have to raise more fish in order to build that stock back up. Natural spawning uh, fish in this river, and I go up and down it hundreds of times a year, and I have not seen one natural spawning fish anywhere in this river. And I have a really good network of guides and, and that I talk to and, and get information on the water in all different stretches of the river. And I ask them if they're seeing any um, natural spawning fish. So I have a good uh, resource of, of getting the science brought to me by other individuals. And they're not seeing anything either. It's just really unbelievable. I, to this day, I'm just astonished that it is. We are where we are today on the Sacramento River itself. stopped raising fry at this hatchery in 1999 and the past 24 years there have only been smolt releases up to 12 million smolt but i'm happy to report that starting this year currently right now as this film is being aired we are introducing the fry back into the river and into the floodplains to try to repopulate the sacramento main stem river for fall chinook Behind me, as you see, is all of the new plumbing that just was installed the last few weeks, funded by the Bureau of Reclamation in order to raise more fish at this facility. I'm really happy to announce that up to 14 million more fish are gonna be raised at Coleman moving forward in 2023. NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association has been fighting to raise more fish at this facility for well over seven years. And we're very happy to say thank you to Coleman National Fish Hatchery and U.S. Fish and Wildlife for approving this project and moving it forward so that more fish can be in the system, in the river, for the species and for angling for all of you. So this project is really unique. Like, you know, we have fishermen, we have water users, we have farmers, we have scientists and agencies. And I think it's this rare opportunity where everybody gets to sit at the table and try and do something. And for mostly worse is we're dealing with the current crisis of the closure of the salmon fishery. But sometimes you have to take advantage of a crisis. And I think this crisis has coalesced this group together to do things that might not have otherwise happened because of the urgency of the, the situation. And because of that, we've had this opportunity where we can change some of the hatchery management practices, particularly with fry releases, early fry releases on floodplains. And as part of that, we're bringing on some new technologies into the hatchery management and kind of salmon management in general in the state, particularly the parental based tagging, which is basically just 23andMe for fish, is that we wanna see who these fish's parents were. And we're able to do that with some of the new genetic techniques that we're developing. And so what we're doing is we have this opportunity to take these large numbers of fish, rear them in floodplain habitats, and then release them as they're growing up out into the ocean and look at their contribution to the ocean fishery, the freshwater fishery, and returning to adults. And with this whole group of people coming together is the really the, it is an opportunity that we haven't had thus far. And it is an opportunity that we need to make sure we take advantage of to get all of the information so that when these fish come back in three to five years, is that we can say if the actions that we did had a significant impact and which specific actions were driving that impact. So when you look at this in 15, 20 years from now, we wanna make sure that we are able to quantify the actions we made, whether they were beneficial, whether they were bad. But you know, the big thing is, is that if we don't learn from the things that we're doing, you know, the longevity and the sustainability of our salmon is gonna be really imperiled. And it's really one of the things that 
gives me hope in this process is that it wasn't until now that we see this coming together from different people who you oftentimes wouldn't expect to be partners. And our science has moved along to the point where we're able to use these new techniques to monitor these big actions. We're not releasing tens or hundreds of fish, but millions of fish and able to ask those questions. These are questions that we wouldn't have been able to ask, you know, 10 years ago and actually see which one of our specific actions are having a, an effect on the salmon population. One of the largest things that we've been fighting for for the past four years since our last sequel film, Unspawned, was to shut the hatchery gate at the bottom of the fish ladder here on the Feather River for the Feather River Hatchery. For years, the department had been killing thousands of fish unspawned because of the management practices at this hatchery. We're very happy to say and thank you to CDFW and Department of Water Resources for installing the gate finally at the bottom of the ladder, preventing this practice of killing unspawned fish. Now that the gate can shut, once the hatchery has enough fish, we can now allow the rest of these fish to naturally spawn in the low flow channel below me. We're here today on the top of the American River below Nimbus Dam, which was the dam that was put in place to trap water for flood protection at Folsom Lake. Here at the new ladder that was just implemented over the past few years, the salmon come to this final spot where they come up this long ladder, which is over a mile long, in order to get into the hatchery for the future of mitigation, collecting eggs. One of the things that CDFW has done here at this hatchery recently is started implementing a fry program, releasing fish unmarked through parental base tagging, PBT. And our organization has led that fight to move forward to raising more fish so that we can once get this river back to the population that is necessary for escapement through the species as well as for local anglers for harvest. We're getting little success. You know, I deal with government agencies in my business and, you know, dealing with that iceberg is just that, you know, the bureaucracy. But having successes, as little as they may seem, are just that, they are successes. In order to win the war, we have to win a lot of little battles. And the people in this organization, I mean, the guides, like I said, so many of them are personal friends. And when I have an opportunity to go out with them, we have a, just such a fun time. And I take my employees, I take clients, I take friends of friends. And there are some employees that have never even been on the water. And all of a sudden they come out and see the resources here and had no idea that it existed. And then a little later on, I'm hearing about them taking peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and their kids onto the beach and they have a great time. Uh, but back to the organization, uh, the heart, the character of all the people that are in, in here, from the board on down to, to the guides. Diverse set of personalities. Um, every walk of life, retirees that are making a business, guys, kids that have been on a boat for years are now starting their businesses. Um, everything I do is about relationships and the relationship that this organization has brought and developed more relationships. I can't say enough and just how proud of it I am and that's why I write a check and very happy to. We've politicized water and salmon so much that people don't want to talk about it. Our government has put our own communities against each other, putting farmers against fishermen and putting other interests against each other when we should all be working together on a common goal. Fish need water, but they only mainly need water at certain stages of their life cycle. They need water to get out to sea and survive. And then they need water to protect their reds when they're making their nest and spawning naturally. If we could simply fix those two things with our water issues, we would have a lot more salmon. NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association is working tirelessly to make sure that we get the sediment removed out of the confluence of the Yuba and Feather River. 
Our organization has been working on this project for a number of years with Sutter Butte Flood Control Agency and DWR. We've already removed 67,000 cubic yards of sediment out of the river in phase one. In phase two project, we will be removing the island behind me at the confluence of the Yuba and Feather River. Once that sediment is removed, it will restore this confluence to its original conditions. One of the organization's top priorities is to have DWR follow the Lower Feather River Corridor Management Plan, which is designed to remove the sediment out of the river from Marysville down to the mouth at Verona. It is estimated currently that there's over 8 million cubic yards of sediment in the Feather River. This sediment not only has blocked public access, clogged ramps, but is creating a major issue for adult salmon that are returning to these rivers to spawn. The shallow, wide, hot rivers are not conducive for proper salmon management. We need to restore the entire river back to its original shape, dredge the entire river, remove the sediment so that these salmon have deeper cold water pools to stage in as they're working on their migration up the river. Hey, my name is Amy Ferguson and I'm with the NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association. I'm a board member. I joined the organization because I've seen how hard they fight to make sure that not only my kids, but my grandkids are gonna have the ability to, to keep fishing. As a kid, being able to go out as a family, spend the day fishing, and then going home, cooking that meal up together, spending that quality time was very important to me. And the thought that my grandkids might not have that um, is devastating. So being able to be a part of this organization and see how hard every board member, uh, and especially you James, fight for the right for every fisherman in the state of California, it means a lot to me. My name is Jason Thatcher. I'm one of the board of directors with the NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association. Today we're out on the main stem of the Sacramento River putting late fall, late fall carcasses uh, back into the river. Um, for those who might not know, the Sacramento River has suffered a catastrophic decline in uh, natural spawning uh, king salmon. Uh, when you lose a, a natural spawning component of salmon, you're, the, the river's missing out on basically 10, 15, 20 pound sacks of fertilizer. Every one of these fish contributes back to the ecosystem. The entire, the entire ecosystem in the Sacramento River is gonna benefit from each and every one of these carcasses. Everything from the bug life, juvenile fish, wild trout, um, salmon fry, salmon smolt, everything that, that is in this river, even to the eagles. We're, we're within eyesight of two different eagle nests right here. Within a few hours, eagles are gonna be picking up these fish as they, they wash up close to the gravel bar. They're gonna benefit. Every one of these, these fish is a sack of fertilizer. I think the betterment of the fisheries, you know, the working with our biologist and CDFW here, and that interagency management should be better coordinated in order to regulate the water temperatures and the flows that are producing and giving these fish an ample opportunity to come back and spawn. I mean, they're just, when there isn't the water temperatures and the flows in order for them to be able to come back up and spawn, you know, it, we're, we don't have to be scientists to know that the low water flows, when we see dead fish coming up and then they're dying before they can get to cold water or there is no cold water, it's an obvious sign we have some management issues and a lack of interagency correspondence to protect these fish. Well, in the absence of salmon fishing this summer, a lot of us have had some time to sit around and it's not necessarily our number one skill set, but a lot of us have done some digging into how salmon is managed and how our rivers are managed. And one thing that I've really learned is that there are a huge number of agencies involved. There are a huge number of scientists and managers and everybody else you can imagine involved in the salmon population of California. And it's been extremely complicated. I've learned a whole lot and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of how many people are involved with salmon in California. And one thing that would be great is if we had a single clearinghouse that maybe even a clearinghouse with all of the information about salmon in California would be a great first step. But even better than that would be 
a single entity that managed salmon through all parts of its life cycle or coordinated with all of the agencies that are involved with salmon throughout its life cycle. Because I suspect that one of the main drivers of the collapse of this population is that there are so many pieces and there are so many people working on it that the ball got dropped somewhere and nobody else noticed. Whereas if we had a system and a succinct salmon management plan that brought all of those people together, then somebody would have noticed. Somebody would have noticed before our jack count was abysmally low in the fall of 2022. NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association started in 1992, bringing professional guides together with sportsmen and women to advocate for Sac Valley fisheries issues, wildlife management, water policy, conservation goals, and hatchery production increases. Today, our organization has grown to represent hundreds of fishing guides and thousands of sportsmen and women. Our organization has become the largest fishing advocacy group in California, being represented by our staff and lobbyists in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Although the 2023 salmon season is closed and 2024 looks bleak, we are optimistic that better fishing days will be with us soon. NCG ASA continues to lead through these challenging times in the past few years by working with many state directors, state and federal departments, elected officials, organizations, and commissions. Our leadership sits on many appointed committees, including the PFMC SAS, CAC SST, and State Anadromous Fish Committees. In total, we attend hundreds of meetings with CDFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, National Marine Fishery Service, Department of Water Resources, and U.S. Bureau of Reclamation annually. Our recent accomplishments have included lobbying the state of California to raise millions of more salmon, resulting in increased hatchery production goals and more fish on your boats. Diversifying hatchery release strategies such as the fry program, pre-smolt, and smolt releases. Regulation changes to include and promote more access and opportunity through the Fish and Game Commission. Sediment removal in the Feather River. Advocating for proper water drop-down management by Department of Water Resources to eliminate sediment releases. Supporting grants to build new launch ramps and facilities. And cleaning up our local closed launch ramps, promoting fishing through our fishing derbies, and increasing participation and angler enthusiasm through our lifetime license giveaways, which 10 to 12 our kids every single year. Our future goals, we will continue to advocate for positive change to the current fall run salmon management to include raising more fish, parental base tagging, floor escapement increases, proper harvest management models in the ocean, and overall salmon management success. Our organization is also engaged in other fishery management for sturgeon, striped bass, trout, and kokanee. We will continue to build relationships and engage in any issue with other groups that align with our mission. Our organization's strength comes from our membership. They are the blood of this organization and continues to drive our mission. Without you, our voices will never be heard. We appreciate all the support from our guides, sponsors, and donors to support positive changes in fisheries and wildlife management in California. When you sign up to be a member of NCG ASA, you become family, and it shows you are committed to fighting for your kids and grandkids' future in the outdoors. Together, we are the Sportsman's Voice. Thank you for your support of NorCal Guides and Sportsman's Association. Join us today at ncgasa.org.